Dave Peterson is our next speaker. He's a professor of forest biology at the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences and Emeritus Senior Research Scientist with the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. He has conducted research on climate change and fire science throughout Western <clears throat> United States and has published 250 scientific articles and four books on these topics. He has been a contributing author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and led the forests chapter of the fourth National Climate Assessment. He currently works on climate change assessments and adaptation on federal lands in the Western United States. Dave lives in Skagit County, Washington, where he manages Mountain Heart Farm. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Well, good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank the conference organizers for the invitation to participate in this conference. I think it's a really important topic at a really important point in time and we'd like to go through an awful lot of different topics today, both general and specific. I will try to provide a bit of an introduction to the broader content of the subject matter today in my presentation. So let's go right ahead with the next slide. We're going to dive right in here, no fooling around. And I just want to make this statement that it's time to change the paradigm a bit from restoration to resilient ecology. Restoration has served us well for decades now, but uh, even Don Falk, who was the founder of the Society for Ecological Restoration and, and one of the leaders in this field, has made this quote here that we need to embrace change and not resist it. And if we want to have functional ecological systems, we have that we want functional ecological systems that remain viable and can adapt in a warmer climate. So we're at a, a, the cusp of a transition here in not just the climate, but how we think about the climate and how we think about sustainable resource management for the future. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to toss out the word restoration, but we need to start using the word resilience a lot more. Next. Okay. So here are the, the concepts that have served us well in the past. We've talked a lot about uh, trying to reach an equilibrium condition. We've talked about succession proceeding in a rather linear fashion for plants. We've used this term natural or historic range of variation quite a bit. We have typically used species as our primary management target. And an awful lot of our restoration work is focused on relatively small scale projects across the landscape. Next. And I'd like to suggest now that we start to change that dialogue a little bit and change the terminology. So rather than equilibrium, let's start thinking more about non-equilibrium. Let's talk about dynamic systems. Next. Let's talk about not just one trajectory for succession, but most likely multiple trajectories, particularly with more disturbances. Next. Rather than natural range of variation or historic range, let's try to project a little bit what we expect for the future range of variation across the landscape. Next. And rather than using just species as targets, I suggest that we start thinking more about using structure and function of ecosystems as our targets. And next. And to the extent possible, if we can do larger scale projects or at least link projects across larger landscapes, we'll have a, a much better baseline and kind of a core of sustainability across the landscape in our restoration work. Next. So just a very quick review of some things that uh, a lot of us have seen a lot of, but I just want to make sure we're all on the, the same page here. So this is the latest um, NOAA graph of global temperature. Next. And we can certainly see the direction things are going here. I think we're all familiar with this. But, you know, look at that last 10-year period. Um, you know, the last seven years in the record are the seven warmest years. So that's a pretty significant Thing to look at in terms of what we can expect, perhaps even for the next 10 years. So this, this is an important figure, even though it's one that we've seen a lot. Next. The, the key factor for vegetation and for restoration, I think, will be this, this uh, increased frequency and duration of droughts. So if we use this uh, parameter called drought severity index and we compare uh, these two different time periods, two 26-year time periods, we see that there's a lot more red and orange 
on the right map, the more recent historical period, than there was in the previous uh, period of time. So this is just a very visual, easily observed way to suggest that, yes, things are, in fact, changing pretty rapidly. And then let's just look at the last 20-year period. Uh, these are the data for the state of Washington from drought.gov. If you haven't looked at drought.gov, I recommend you take a look at that. There's some great maps, and they have um, you know, 20 years or so of historical data available for uh, the United States. So take a look at that one. Uh, this simply shows the time series of 20 years here, and the more orange and more red the colors, the deeper that drought was for that particular year. And so I put some little arrows here by the big drought years. So we can see over the last 20 years, we've had five years that had significant drought. I'm really concerned about those five years because those are the years that will tend to facilitate change and facilitate stress. We're not so concerned about the average years or the, the non-drought years. It's those, those occasional but extreme years that cause the change. And with that as a baseline, now let's just look into the future a little bit. This is the standard uh, projection of future temperature that many of you have probably seen in one form or another. The upper orangish colors are projections from models for a high emissions future, essentially the trajectory that we're currently on. And the lower bluish colors are a future scenario in which we have more collaboration across uh, nations and reduce emissions significantly. And right about 2050, mid-century, we see that the, tr the trends for those particular modeling projections diverge. And if we stay on the current track we're on, we go to a very warm future. I mean, even the global, co global cooperation future is fairly warm. But that upper one is pretty bad news in terms of the rate of change that we could experience. So just keep this in mind as we go through our future discussion here. Again, let's talk about drought. This is a projection, oh, go back, okay. This is a projection of water balance deficit. Just think of this as lack of water in the soil, if you will. And we see the projection for the 2040s and the 2080s. Uh, this is for a higher end emission scenario. And we see this you know, continually increasing uh, brownish colors here that reflect increasing water balance deficit during summer. Summer is where the action is for the Pacific Northwest, even on the west side where we're focused today. So this is um, a pretty grim looking future if we stay on our current emissions track. Next. And I, I really like to emphasize this business about how much extremes matter when we're managing ecosystems. So if we look at our good old uh, probability uh, curve here, uh, we see a frequency of occurrence on the y-axis, departure from average on the x-axis. And so the frequency, extent, and severity of our future extreme events could really be affected by climate change. And you see if we, if we change this by a standard deviation, we, we bump that average, that little red uh, arrow up at the top there, we bump that ahead just a little bit but look what happens down at the tail of the curve. All of a sudden now, something that may have occurred once every 40 years, like a drought, will now occur once every six years. So that's a huge change. It's, it's the thing that we should be most concerned about moving into the future. And so we really need to think about these extremes as we go about uh, decision-making and planning for sustainable ecosystems. Uh, again, it's all about the tail of this curve. That's what we're really focused on here. Okay, so just a, a little bit of information here to get us started. So I, I like to use the terms wetlands and groundwater dependent systems along with riparian areas because they are considered somewhat differently in the scientific literature. Um, anyway, for all of these systems, depth and duration of water, groundwater flow, flooding frequency, uh, extent and timing, and soils are all really key factors in the functionality of these systems and also in the uh, plant species composition and, and pretty much how they function in general. All of these different factors will be affected by climate change, especially higher temperature and reduced snowpack upstream that affects uh, stream water flow downstream. All right. Now, in addition to 
discussing riparian areas specifically, I also want to uh, mention the other kinds of forests that we find at low elevations on the west side here, uh, particularly our iconic forests that contain conifers such as Douglas fir, western hemlock, cedar, spruce, and so forth. And the key here is that all these forests are moisture limited to start with. I mean, there's this sort of mythology that the Pacific Northwest is so wet we don't have to worry about this. But we have dry summers. Even if we don't think about climate change, we have dry summers. If you dig a soil pit in almost any forest on the west side in the summer, it will be very dry. So the growth of these trees is limited by soil moisture now and will continue to be more limited in the future. So we expect these trees will grow slower in the future throughout uh, the west side of the Cascades. So now let's get into some good stuff. Um, how can we manage for more resilient systems in this warmer climate? And we will now try to focus as much as we can on riparian systems. But before we dive into that, I think this context is extremely important, and sometimes we forget about this. We are not dealing with natural systems for the most part anymore. You know, over 90% of our forests have been harvested at least once. Uh, all of our landscapes are fragmented by various causes, timber harvest, or agriculture, uh, urban areas, and so forth. Uh, some of our forests have a significant amount of non-natives. We have invasives all over the place, insects, pathogens. And this little factor about beavers, which we sometimes forget, maybe not riparian specialists, but you know, our previous landscapes in the 1800s were absolutely covered with wetlands and riparian areas as a result of beavers. So we've changed that as well, although uh, they're also being successful in some areas at making the comeback. So uh, kind of a, a wild card that we need to think about. But anyway, keep this context in mind as we go through this. It's terribly important to understand your site. And we think, well, it's, you know, floodplain site is a floodplain site or an interior coniferous forest, riparian sites are all the same, but they're, they're actually usually very different. So know your site history. What has happened there in the past that could affect the future? Uh, and take a bigger landscape focus. Don't just look at your 10-acre your project site or your 100-acre project site. What's uphill? What's downhill? What's upstream? What's downstream? How do those factors affect what you're going to do at your site and how that will change over time? And have, get a good understanding of soils and geomorphology if you can. I know a lot of us who are plant ecologists tend to look at the green stuff above the ground, but that brown stuff below ground may in many cases determine exactly what happens into the future. So if you're not a soil specialist yourself, find somebody who is, dig some soil pits, and understand what's going on out there, especially the spatial variability. Um, project the future conditions to the best of your knowledge. Uh, what happens if your stream starts to move around? What happens if beavers move in? What about other disturbances? What's your current vegetation composition? What's the potential for having invasive species move into that area? That may affect a lot about what you do in terms of planting and management. And then finally, what do you anticipate will be future maintenance needs here? Will you need to do more planting in the future? <clears throat> will you need to do some thinning of trees? And what about access for uh, workers who, to actually get out to that site? So what I'd like to do now is talk about some ideas and some general kinds of uh, what we might call best management practices. To start that off, I'd like to suggest that we think in maybe a little bit more of a structured way about risk assessment and risk management. We often do this anyway, but we may not put it into kind of a formal structure where we can revisit it from year to year. So the first question here relative to how will you go about doing riparian restoration with climate change is, you know, what are those challenges for meeting your project objectives? Number two, how might you need to revise project activities when you're thinking about climate change. We all have favorite ways of doing projects, but how will we revise them? And then how would those new approaches compare in terms of effectiveness and feasibility to your originally proposed activities? Does that make it harder? Uh, does it change it somehow? Does it make it more expensive? Uh, does it uh, modify the number of people you might need on the project? All those sorts of things. So anyway, these are very general questions, but I think they they make the job of integrating climate change a little bit more uh, effective and efficient. 
So we'll go through here just a series of what I call good practices, uh, things that will be amenable to climate smart management. In many cases, as we go through this, you'll say, oh, hey, we already do that. And that's true. And I think that's true of an awful lot of sustainable resource management in general, whether we're talking about riparian areas or if we're talking about neighbors on the national forest or state forests, we're already doing a lot of good things with management that may already be somewhat climate smart, but being climate smart might revise our practices a bit or it might mean we set new priorities in terms of locations and which, gets, which project gets done first. So um, we just want to eradicate as many of the non-climate stressors as we can. That's always a good idea anyway. So getting rid of our invasives, um, uh, after disturbance, try to get plants back on the ground as quickly as you can, keep the cattle out of there, and uh, also sometimes we forget that roads uh, next to our sites can have significant damage, so try to manage any of those impacts as well. And I, I really love this photo of knotweed. I'm, not, I'm guessing maybe at least a few of you on the call today have seen some, some things like that, but hopefully it hasn't been growing over your head. Regeneration, the establishment phase of trees and other of plants is where the action will be for climate change. This is where the big competition happens. There'll be this scramble after disturbances or after some change at the site, and you have to get those plants established as quickly as you can because they will be the winners and the ones that persist into the future. So even in riparian areas, we need to often be concerned about retaining enough soil moisture for our seedlings to grow well. Uh, again, summers are dry, and for small plants, their root systems are small. It's not difficult, especially in well-drained soils, for the soil to dry out enough to create stress for those plants. So we really need to do a good job taking care. We might use a little mulch in places and, of course, protect them from critters that like to eat those plants. And I'd, I'd like to encourage folks to think about planting as many species as might be feasible or desirable for a particular site. Now, I know some projects you might say, well, we've got a thousand willow sticks. We're going to go out and plant those willows. And I think that's great. But there may be ways to diversify the species composition, which will confer some resilience of that site to future uh, conditions. So even on a, a very wet site, there may be convexities topographically where you can plant things like Sitka spruce and uh, western red cedar. Uh, of course, our hardwoods like red alder and big leaf maple are, are very amenable to wetter sites, maybe not stand, standing water all year. But try to find ways that you can diversify uh, even small areas of your site. Now, diversification is almost always going to be our friend in terms of increasing resilience to climate change. The diversification allows you to have some options available across any particular landscape. It sort of hedges your bets, if you will. So if you lose one particular location or one particular species, you still have some biodiversity present across the landscape. And this can be done at various spatial scales. Uh, in this case, we're showing a kind of a big picture, large spatial scale that can be considered as one way for diver to diversify. At something more of a mesoscale, we can uh, create diversification by looking very carefully at local topography, uh, water flow, uh, groundwater flow, and general patterns of soil moisture and uh, distribution. Now, we also have to consider here different aspects, different elevation, and topographic variations such as convexity and concavity. So lots of variation in relatively small landscapes. And then finally, at, at much smaller spatial scales, we can diversify canopy structure. We can have some areas that have open canopies, some that have closed canopies, uh, multiple canopy layers, and everything in between. Again, this all confers different types of um, diversity and, and resilience to the system. It also really is a magnificent thing for wildlife habitat, again, depending on what you're uh, managing for in any particular place. So we've looked here at three different spatial scales of diversity. I'm just going to mention this quickly. This is kind of a teaser. Uh, thinking about 
uh, a greater awareness of the genetic component of our plantings in the future. Now, we have several really good talks coming up here that are going to go into this in greater detail, so I'm not going to do it right now, but I think it's, it's something that we need to start thinking about more of in the future. Also, I, I'm afraid that we may have to do more maintenance in some of our future projects. So there might be some uh, additional planting to do or thinning, or you may have to remove some invasives or whatever. But in any case, uh, don't just walk away from the project. Go back there once a year, once every two years, do some monitoring, uh, check out not just your, the success of your plants, but how's the soil moisture doing? How's the stability of the site? Are there any things happening out there that you hadn't anticipated? So this doesn't take long, maybe an annual check, and uh, this is the way that we, we can learn about how successful our project is and what things might have to be fine-tuned going into the future. So in summary, uh, here's some things that we can expect to occur in the future. We're almost certain at this point in time that temperatures will be increasing. And, we'll, and that, in fact, that's, that's even more in the future, as well as snowpack decreasing. Now, you might not worry too much about the snowpack up in the mountains, but that affects what happens downstream in terms of frequency and duration of flooding, uh, and it affects water supply in the summer. So in many cases, we have kind of a worst-case scenario here of, you know, flashier water movement in the winter, but less water in the summer. So this is a, a situation that could cause considerable stress in the future. We have less certainty of exactly how the distribution and abundance of our native plant species will sort themselves out with respect to climate change in the future. I have a feeling that in riparian areas we'll be a little bit more buffered than we would be on upland sites or on the east side of the Cascades, but some of the riparian species are, are fairly fine-tuned to specific moisture availability, so I expect we will, in fact, have some effects there. Also, uh, effects on uh, wildlife habitat go hand-in-hand. This is important in almost all cases because our riparian areas are typically hot spots of biodiversity. So we want to make sure that even though these are small areas of the landscape, that they're functional enough to provide the ecosystem services such as habitat that we'd like to have happen. Extreme events, you know, these rare but uh, big events that could change things are the ones that I'm most concerned about. Those droughts that we talked about earlier that will probably be more frequent in the future and last longer in the future. The increased flooding that could occur due to this reduced snowpack upstream, that will also have an effect. So again, we're not so concerned about the average effects. So moving into the future and creating resilience, we need to think about how will these systems be resilient and endure these bigger disturbances in the future. Um, I pointed out that year 2050, you know, our mid-century point where those models of future temperature diverge. I don't want to get hung up on that, but I do think that's a point at which we may start seeing some bigger changes occurring. So we really need to think that this is an issue of some urgency because 30 years isn't all that far away. And, you know, there, there's always going to be surprises. I think we all find that anyway. Whatever project we implement on the ground, things always happen that we didn't anticipate. So, you know, build in some buffers and some psychological space for yourself um, about those surprises. So a quick synopsis of what we can do. Again, this idea of thinking more about resilience of our ecosystem, uh, not so much restoration for targets based on past conditions, such as species, but more about what we can sustain into the future. Now, some of that, as I suggested, might just be fine-tuning, but that fine-tuning might be the difference between a successful and unsuccessful project. In terms of thinking about restoration and resilience, think about 30 years from now or even farther down the road because you want these to be sustainable systems. That will be a future of higher temperatures and more extremes. And so really have to think out of the box, what would this look like if you had a drought every two or three years, for example? 
How would that change your species selection? How would that change where you plant things across the landscape? Diversification is our friend here, and that includes diversifying species composition, uh, genetic characteristics of our species, and spatial patterns, especially spatial patterns. Again, I'd like to suggest that implementing risk assessment and risk management is a great framework for how to go about this. You know, make lists and, and make box and arrow charts and all those sorts of things, whatever you need to really understand your system so that you can use your projections of future change to inform your decisions about various management choices. And then this, this last thing here is terribly critical. We have to continue to implement monitoring of all of our uh, project sites so we can learn what works and what doesn't work. This is just part of normal adaptive management. If something isn't working, you can adjust it as needed. So uh, this is an iterative, cyclical part of project management. So just to wrap up here, um, I would like to encourage folks who are on the seminar today to really start to get more comfortable about managing with uncertainty. And we all do that to a certain extent because nobody can project the future. But climate change really ups the ante here. And so we, we need to think more broadly in terms of what might be acceptable outcomes for our projects. This point here about share your stories, um, you have an amazing community of practice here today. We have you know, almost 200 people on this discussion. That's a huge group of people, and everybody's out there doing all kinds of great stuff. Share your stories. You know, you talked about this being the first annual conference. I hope, I hope it is the first, and I hope there's a second, third, and more where people can share their successes and failures, and so we can um, do this collectively as a community of practice. And just a word for, you know, let's get on this. Uh, we've talked about this for quite a long time now in terms of adjusting management practices relative to climate. And we will never have 100% certainty on how fast the temperature is going to change and how fast soil moisture is going to change. But we certainly have enough information scientifically to get going on climate smart management now. So um, I look forward to engaging any questions that you might have if we have time. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, there, there are some questions in the chat. I'll read the question verbatim. It says, how do you think about the potential for a switch to a regular fire regime on the west side? Yeah, that, that's a topic of great interest these days. And we're hearing a lot more about west side fire. And perhaps we should after what happened in Oregon this year where we had some enormous uh, crown fires that occurred on, on the west side there. You know, hundreds of thousands of acres, very fast moving fires. And so people ask me, well, could that happen in western Washington? The answer, of course, is yes, it could happen. In all honesty, there's not that much that we can probably do about those kinds of fires. They certainly couldn't in western Oregon. Uh, we could talk about doing fuels management on the west side as they do on the east side. In most cases, it's not very practical. Um, I guess I will hope that most of our riparian systems will be relatively resistant to uh, these kinds of fires if they do occur, but we can't guarantee that. Um, I'm not sure I would change much about riparian management in terms of uh, fire risk for the future. But if there are opportunities to do fuel reductions, you could do that. Uh, if you have a riparian project where you, it's dominated mostly by conifers, you know, say Sitka spruce and, and um, uh, shore pine, for example, species like that, you could, in fact, manage the density of those species to reduce the spread of fire in the future. But I think it's a tough, it's a very tough objective to try to make our riparian systems more resistant. Are there specific species that you would recommend as more climate resilient? Well, in all honesty, I think any species is climate resilient if it's planted in the right place for the right reason. So that's why I made that, that point about, you know, putting things in the correct topographic positions by landforms. So convexities versus concavities, north aspect versus south aspect. Um, I do think that species that have broad environmental tolerances might be some of our most successful ones. So I'll, I'll just say, again, shore pine, which you can almost plant in standing water, but will also be tolerant of dry conditions. 
Uh, some of our willows, uh, which are, of course, very amenable to wet conditions, are also somewhat tolerant of dry conditions. So we might take a look at, at those kinds of species that can tolerate both, both wet and dry. Okay, and then um, on the issue of soil moisture, the, there was a question about mulch. When would you recommend mulching? Oh, I, I think I'd mulch at the time of planting, if you could. And so I, I know folks think, boy, that's a lot of work dragging truckloads of mulch out there. Um, but if there is a lot of organic matter on the soil surface to start with, you can just kind of kick some of that up around the base of the plant. And, you know, anything will help those small root systems become established. But I, I would do it at the time of planting, and then if you have the opportunity to refresh it later on, you could do that as well. Do you see performance standards changing to allow for more flexibility in what success looks like? How do you think the 10-year window of maintenance and monitoring could evaluate long-term resilience for 30 years plus? Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's a wonderful question, and I, I do think that we might have to broaden you know, what we find to be acceptable outcomes in some cases. Um, and I think that's, that's your call as practitioners to go ahead and do that based on what you know about the science of this issue and so forth and based on what you would consider to be a, a, um, a resilient condition or a sustainable condition. And I think 10 years sounds kind of like a long interval to me. I, I feel much comfortable with five years or less and maybe even less than that shortly after uh, planting. So we want to make sure things get on a good trajectory early because those early survivors will be the ones that will persist on that site. Yeah, um, uh, David, you mentioned uh, the need for diversity in plantings. And uh, just a second ago, you mentioned a couple uh, specific um, species with the shore pine and the willows. Um, I'm sure that we're going to hear later today about the idea of um, assisted migration or potentially just the, the fact that, that the plant communities are going to change. And so for Western Washington, we're potentially going to start seeing a lot more species from Southern Oregon, for example, moving, moving up here. Uh, so when you were talking about diversity, you, you did mention sort of uh, some of the mainstay Western Washington species, but you didn't really um, mention anything about how the plant communities themselves are going to change. So would you recommend that we're still using the, the, the common and typical Western Washington species, or do we need to start thinking about changing the palette? Well, that's a great question. You're gonna hear a lot more about that in subsequent talks. So um, I guess what I'll say is, in terms of my opinion, is we can get by with our current species, but perhaps with a broader range of genetic characteristics for those species. And I think I'm going to leave it at that because our, our subsequent speakers are going to go into this topic in great detail. Here's a similar question. Um, any thoughts on functional guilds and climate change? Seems like functional diversity is key, especially now more ex extremophilic species. I don't know if I said that right. Not a botanist, geologist. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I guess I agree, agree with the, the general sense of that comment and question. Um, in, my, in, in my working with small forest landowners in Washington state, what I have found is that most people seem to be happy if they can get something that will survive in the long run and they aren't as all fixed on species as much as having a functional forest. So that may include species that are not currently within the current distribution or whatever, but that's going to depend an awful lot on the objectives of any particular project and what your constraints may be. Some people just don't want to want to think outside what our current distribution of species are, but, but yes, those species that are um, perhaps more tolerant of extreme conditions, we should take a good close look at those and how those can contribute, but also do so thoughtfully in a spatial context, not just to do it randomly across a grid, but to do it with great consideration to topographic variation and where each species is most likely to survive under a much warmer future climate 30 to 50 years from now. 
um, does the shift to resilience ecology versus restoration inherently prioritize hardier plants over endangered and threatened species? That's a tough one. And I know that threatened and endangered species are often significant constraints in terms of how we go about doing projects. And they often are a focal point, an objective of a successful project is the, is the uh, persistence of those species through time. Personally, I think it's going to be increasingly difficult to prioritize threatened and endangered species. I mean, we have to do that because it's the law, but creating conditions and habitats and ecosystems that allow the broadest range of species to survive into the future, I think, is a more practical way to go about it. So that's going to be a juggling act in the future to comply with regulations, um, but also ensure broader uh, resilience of larger systems. Won't be easy. And here's the million dollar question we've all been waiting for. How do we get a change in um, change to resilience ecology mindset to sink in with the funders and get these kinds of projects funded? I think, I think you all as a community just need to keep talking about this. Um, if, if folks at the top of the food chain or the money chain aren't thinking of it, well, they, they, they need to start doing that. But I, I think there are compelling ways that we can discuss this, you know, in terms of we will be successful if X, Y, Z, and make a compelling argument for it using the appropriate scientific references. And I also think as projects start to come online, and demonstrate success, we'll have lots of examples that we can point to and say, hey, this worked over here and here, and we want to emulate this. I, I think it will happen. And I think at least in terms of surfboard funding, um, RCO is just now getting around to incorporating climate change into their criteria for projects. So it, it's been a long time coming, but it's, I think those wheels are turning. Okay, here's a long one. Um, lately, some researchers have started to question the term resilience because it is overused as a de facto response to all things climate, to the point that it loses all meaning. Some of these strategies and tactics highlighted here focus more on transforming ecosystems to adjust to climate change, right? Not always trying to bounce back to a historical or even current conditions. Right. No, that's, that's a good point. Uh, resilience is a jargon word. It means different things to different people. Um, I haven't found a better generic term to use yet, so I, I continue to use that. But I think it, it, it behooves all of us to define what resilience is in the context of our particular project or organization and to be flexible, uh, recognizing that different people have different ways of looking at this. Now, the, this term transformation comes up increasingly as well in terms of, you know, do we want to project what we want to have out there in 2100? And how would we do things maybe dramatically different in order to do that? And I, I think that's a good concept and we should be thinking in those terms, but we should also be very thoughtful about exactly what we can do with a reasonable amount of certainty of success. So I'm not a person who would recommend we start planting lots of giant sequoias and coast redwoods in the state of Washington, at least not yet. We could do some of that experimentally. We know those species grow well here, but we should do these really big transformative kinds of uh, actions uh, with some caution for the time being. 